In this video, we're going to look at some advanced applications of the multiplication rule. First off, the probability of getting at least one of something uh, in repeated trials, and then we'll look at conditional probability. First, let's review the addition rule, um, which says the probability of A or B is uh, the probability of A plus B minus the probability of both of them happening. And then the um, special case, uh, simplification, if A and B happen to be disjoint, which means they don't have any, uh, there are no outcomes that would cause them both to happen, they're, they have nothing in common, basically, uh, then the probability of A and B is zero, so the addition rule simplifies to simply P of A plus P of B. That's if the two events, A and B, are disjoint. And then we have the multiplication rule, which says the probability of A and B is P of A times the P of B given A. Um, now P of B given A is a conditional probability, so we'll actually look at that in more detail in the second half of this video, uh, because it's not always easy to, uh, it's not always obvious, just like P of A and B. Sometimes when we're doing the addition rule, we have some sort of a table which makes P of A and B, um, you know, we can compute that directly. Sometimes we can't and we have to use the multiplication rule. Well, also, to compute the multiplication rules, sometimes we know this information directly, and sometimes we don't, and we have to use the definition of conditional probability to compute it. So, you know, it just all depends on what we know and what we need to know. Different times, different formulas apply. Again, sometimes these rules can be simplified in special cases. If A and B are independent, which means their probabilities don't affect one another, um, you know, the occurrence of one doesn't make the probability of the other any more or less, any higher or lower. And if that's the case, then the multiplication rule simplifies to simply P of A and B equals P of A times P of B. So for an or, we add. And for an and, we multiply. Okay, But if the two events are not independent, we have to actually deal with conditional probability. If the two uh, events are not disjoint, we have to deal with, well, the multiplication rule again. So for the first part of this video, we are going to look at uh, the probability of at least one of something. So we call a definition here of the complement of an event A as the event A bar, which is the collection of all outcomes in which A does not occur. So let's look at an example. Uh, if we toss a fair coin five times, and A is the event that one or more tosses are heads, which could also be said as at least one of the tosses is heads. One or more, at least one, same thing. So let's let A bar be the complement of at least one. Well, we need to consider all of the events in which at least one heads would fail. And the only situation that in which that could happen would be if we had zero heads and five tails. Every other event, uh, whether it's the first toss is heads or the second toss, whatever, or two of them are heads or three or four or five or five, every other possible event would successfully result in at least one heads. The only possible combination of outcomes that could result in at least one heads to fail would be if there are no heads at all. So the complement of uh, having at least one heads out of five tosses is having no heads. Complement of at least one is none. Now since complementary events must complement each other both ways, they're very polite like that, uh, we have to, uh, we can verify this by finding the complement of none are heads. What would that mean? Well, now it's tempting to think that the complement of none would be all our heads, all five, but uh, that is not correct. That's not the only way that none could not happen. We need to consider all of the outcomes in which zero of the tosses are heads 
would not occur. Okay, so let's think about them. Well, we could have um, we could have all five our heads and zero tails. That would cause no heads to be wrong. But we could also have four heads and one tail. We could also have three heads and two tails, or two heads and one tail, or one head and four tails. In other words, any event in which at least one of the outcomes is heads would cause zero of the tosses or heads to fail. So again, we see it that the complement of at least one is none. The complement of none is at least one. So now that we've verified uh, these complements, let's recall that the probability of an event is equal to one minus the probability of its complement, which also means, in this case specifically, that the probability of at least one is equal to one minus the probability of none. Well, this is very helpful in some situations because the probability of none is often much easier to compute. Much, 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 much easier to compute. So let's take a look at um, that example that we were just doing with uh, five tosses of a coin and what's the probability of getting at least one head. Well, let's see. So probability of getting at least one head is equal to the probability of uh, either one head and four tails, or two heads and three tails, or so on. Well, this is an or situation, so we would be using the addition rule. Um, and since, in this case, not an if, but A and B are disjoint, um, right, well, we've actually got five different things here, but these are all disjoint. Uh, we, they can't happen at the same time. We can't have one head and four tails and also have two head and three tails. Right? The intersections are empty, if you will. And so, okay, that does simplify things a little bit. Um, and so we end up with uh, the probability of one head and four tails plus probability of two heads and three tails plus and so on. But this is can be kind of messy because in order to figure out, say, the probability of two heads and three tails, I have to think about, in the classical approach, all the different ways I could successfully have that. Well, let's see, two heads and three tails, it could be maybe the first toss is heads and the second toss is heads and the rest are tails. Or the first toss is heads and the second one's tails and the third is heads and the rest are tails. Or the first and fourth are heads or the first and fifth or the second and third or second and fourth. There's a lot of things to, to add up there, and that can be tricky, certainly if I had even more trials. Here I only have five. It's feasible, but if I'm dealing with, you know, 10, 50, 100, 1,000 trials or something, that's not really feasible at all, um, practically speaking. But not only that, do I have, not only do I have to compute how many times I could, how many ways I could successfully do it, I also have to compute the total number of possibilities. Right. Well, how many total different outcomes are there when we're tossing a coin five times? Well, that's not that big of a deal, but the calculations can be messy because I have to compute number of ways I could successfully get that divided by n, and I have to compute the number of ways I could successfully get that divided by n, and so on, add them all up. It can be very cumbersome. doesn't mean it's not doable, but maybe the other way is easier. So this can be very tedious to compute. But on the other hand, the probability of at least one head is equal to one minus the probability that none are heads because those are complementary events. So let's see if we can compute this. Well, first of all, the probability that none are heads is the same thing as saying they're all tails and saying they're all tails is 
Same thing as saying the first is tails and the second toss is tails and the third toss is tails and the fourth toss is tails and the fifth tails toss is tails. Well, that's an AND probability. And since we have an AND here, that means we get to use the multiplication rule. Probability of an AND situation is we take the probability of the first one times the probability of the second one given the first one. But that simplifies a little bit. If A and B are independent, which they are in this case, so no if about it. Oops, wrong one. Since A and B are independent, then the conditional thing, the given probability, is, you know, it doesn't matter if A occurs or not. It doesn't affect the probability of B. So the probability of this and statement is really just multiplying the two together. Remember, these are independent, meaning um, one event, the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability that the other event might occur. Uh, in other words, in this case, if the first toss is tails or heads, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect what the second toss is going to be. It doesn't make the second toss any more or less likely to be tails. So, so we have the probability of the first is tails times the probability of the second is tails, and so on. And those are all one half. So that's simply one half times one half times dot 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 times one half. Well, if I multiply something by itself five times, I end up with one half to the fifth power, which is also one over thirty-two, which gives me as decimal exactly this actually this isn't rounded exactly point zero three one two. Five. That's my probability. Now we do need to remember that what we just computed was the probability that they're all tails, which means they're all heads. I'm sorry, none are heads, which was the complement. Now what the original question was asking for is the probability of at least one head. And that's equal to one minus the probability that none of them are heads. We just found that to be uh, 0.03123125, and or as a fraction, 132nd. We do that subtraction, we end up with 31 30 seconds, or as a decimal, uh, 31 divided by 32, 0.96875. 0.96875. So, there we go, and that was a whole lot easier. Then I'm going to go in here and, and use my addition rule and to compute all of these things uh, directly it would have been quite a chore. This ended up being much faster conceptually, com computationally, and so on. So that is uh, how we generally want to compute probability of at least one of something occurring if we're dealing with a uh, repeated trial. And we need to know the probability of something happening at least once. It is usually easier to instead compute the probability that it doesn't happen at all um, using uh, the multiplication rule and then subtract from one to get the desired probability that it happens at least once. Now, since we're here, uh, previously we talked about um, rare events and so on. Well, this, this event, probably of at least one heads, has a probability of 0.96875. Uh, the probability of getting no heads was uh, 0 0.03125, which means if I toss a coin five times and I get five tails in a row, it's kind of unusual. Now, 3%, 3.125% of the time, not that freakishly abnormal, but still, it would cause us to be a little suspicious if that happened. Um, but, you know, it doesn't prove it couldn't happen. It certainly could happen. You try it 100 times, it's going to happen about three, about three times out of 100. You know, 3% right there. Now let's take a look at conditional probability. And to do this, we're first going to look at kind of the intuitive approach here. And we're going to start off with an example that we've looked at. Uh, the survey of uh, people in the room and their favorite colors, broken up by male and female. Okay, well first let's find 
what is the probability um, that I would select a stu if I randomly select a person in the room I will select somebody who prefers red given that the person I selected was female now let's think about what this means this means the probability of s that uh, the person selected prefers red given that the selected person is female so that's what that notation with the vertical line means in uh, words well an intuitive approach to this since we have complete information here we have this little table of all of the data um, what we can really do here is we can first let's just assume the person selected is female well, if we assume, assume that the person selected is female, that means that this is our sample space. And all these other values are gone. They don't apply anymore. Right? We assume the person selected is female, then all of these choices over here, they're no longer possibilities. The sample space is reduced to just the outcome satisfying that event, F, the, the given event. And so now, n is the total of the outcomes that satisfy f, which is 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which is 13. And of those 13, the number, number that are successfully read is uh, 2. So 2 out of 13. Two of those 13 are red. Well, that's the intuitive approach to conditional probability. Now we also have a formal uh, rule, formal formula, and it is the probability of B given A is equal to the probability of A and B both occurring, and uh, divided by the probability of A occurring on its own. Well, if you think about it, this actually is just the multiplication rule solved for P of B given A. I mean, and, and just a minute ago, we reviewed the uh, multiplication rule here. That's the same thing we're looking at right here. We just solve for this part of it. it. means we divide both sides by P of A, and we get our formal definition, our formal formula for uh, conditional probability. So uh, the way it would work out in this case is we have to say, probability of R given F. It would be probability of R and F selecting somebody who likes red and also selecting someone who's female divided by the probability of simply selecting someone who is female. Okay, well, probability of red and F. How many ways can we successfully get red and F of um, of the entire uh, original sample space here. So we need to look at the whole thing here, not just our reduced. So looking at the entire s original sample space here, there are two outcomes that are both red and female, both preferring red and female. So that would be two out of the entire original sample space at 28. And then divided by for the probability female, again, we look at, look at how many females there were. There were a total of 13. This would satisfy the event F out of 28. Well, how do I divide by two fractions? We take the first one, the top one, we multiply it by the reciprocal of the other one. And then in this case, we see the 28s cancel out. And of course, we get the same thing that we got intuitively, 2 divided by 13. And that's pretty much how conditional probability works. Uh, we can use the formal rule if we have to, or we can do it intuitively uh, when we can, when we have complete information like this. But I also want to take a look at a, a common uh, issue that many students have with conditional probability. And that it's called confusion of the inverse. It's getting these things switched around. So I want to look at this same table of data here. Do it again. And this time, I want to find the probability of selecting a female given that the selection, the selected person prefers red. Okay, so again, this in words would mean the probability of selecting a female 
given that the selected person prefers red or in other words if we assume that the person prefers red what's the probability that that person will be female you can think of it that way as well well intuitively i can look at this and i can say i've again reduced my uh, my sample space if i'm assuming the person prefers red my sample space is just these five right so my sample space gets reduced to those five that prefer red So intuitively, we assume the select person prefers red and reduce the sample space to the outcomes that satisfy the event R. So our sample space is just uh, those five people. And of those five events, those five outcomes that satisfy the event R, how many of those would successfully be female? Just two. So probability of female given R equals 2 out of 5. Okay. Or uh, formally, we could say probability of F given R is equal to the probability of F and R both happening, F and R, divided by the probability of just R happening by itself. Well, looking at the entire sample space, the probability of F and R, there are two ways of successfully having someone that prefers, that is female and also prefers red. So that's two successes out of the entire sample space of 28 people. And then probability of selecting somebody who prefers red, there are five people that successfully prefer red out of the entire sample space of 28. Okay, well again, how do we divide by fraction? We take the top one, we multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom one. That would be a 5, and so the 28s cancel out. And so once again, we get 2 out of 5. Okay, but I want to point out the two conditional probabilities that we just computed. We computed P of R given F, we got two 13s. We computed P of F given R, and we got two fifths. Okay, so the important thing to realize here is that P of A given B does not equal P of B given A. Now, it could in some situations, but um, most often it does not. They're not the same thing. Again, sometimes it could happen, but generally not. It's definitely not a safe assumption. Uh, so this is called confusion of the inverse. It can lead to um, some big problems uh, if the statisticians or the people interpreting the statistics are not being careful and making sure they get things the right way. So that is a conditional probability.